this house to exalt your name. And our whole purpose of our creation is just to worship you and have intimacy with you. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor that you have bestowed upon us, the sons of God, to adjudicate the word of the Lord in the earth, to be the tongue of the Lord in the earth, to be the wisdom of God, the purpose of God in the earth. And Father, we decree today that your will, which is in the heavens, is being done in the earth right now. In the midst of the darkness, we say the light is going to shine through. In the midst of the trials and the tribulations, we see already the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And your word decrees in the book of Revelation that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of his Lord and of his Christ. Hey, we ought to just give him a praise right there. He's already decreed that it's done. Hey, you're worthy to be praised. Worthy, worthy, worthy. I thank you guys today. God bless you. You're one be bar, one be bar. Hallelujah. Much to say and much to do. And time is moving and you may be seated. And children, you can just go on to Children's Church. We'll turn you loose. And let God begin to move in your life so mightily. They're getting fired up in there. They're casting out devils in children's church. No, that doesn't mean they run their teachers off. <laughs> I got that. No, they're having a good time. I welcome all of you this morning to the house of the Lord. It's going to be a little different today. The Spirit of God has rang my bell. It's different having somebody to not stop me. I was just telling somebody that. I used to have somebody stop me all the time. So I'm going to probably end up getting a whole bunch of trouble because I have nobody to stop me no more. Y'all ain't mad, are you? Y'all looking at me like that just scared you. Well, don't be scared, but I am patriotic. I am spiritual, and I love God, and I love my country. And you just can't cover everything in 30 minutes. Can I get an amen out there? So I've got some stuff up here to read to you. And some things to talk to you about because of the direction of our nation and what's happening. I haven't given up hope myself. I know that you can look at the news. If you listen to the news, it's uh, everything's over. But I don't listen to the news. I listen to the report of the Lord. And sometimes it just doesn't look like it's happening. But that's okay. God has a way of just whoosh, at that last second turning everything around. Can I get an amen out there? So... I've got some things I want to share with you. I was going through one of my little presidential books of the presidents of the past that had very strong godly experiences. I don't know what you know about Abraham Lincoln. Get, get that scripture in Timothy ready. But uh, I know there could be a lot said, uh, a lot of hurt, a lot of happiness in this era of time in the 1860s. But the Republican Party was basically birthed to preserve the freedoms of our country because they saw what was happening. It wasn't birthed because of slavery, but slavery became a major issue, thank God. And we had a man of God that really believed that all men were created equal. And he knew that this nation was called America, which means freedom. No place called freedom has slaves. Can I get an amen? And so Abraham Lincoln in 1863, I probably shouldn't even told you who this was. I wish I'd have just read it first and not even told you the date, but I have blew it, haven't I? And so he simply says this. I want you to listen closely to this because the Americans in the day that they could hear this, they really got into it. And before I read it, let me just go ahead and do this. Let's receive tithes and offerings. So ushers, just come on forward. If you got your tithes and offerings ready, put them in. I know what you're thinking. Preacher, you don't talk about that a whole bunch. I don't have to. You're educated, smart. You're givers. You love God. Nobody has to twist your arm, cry. I don't have to tell you a sad story. You walk by faith and not by sight. And somebody said, amen. amen. All right. Well, while we're receiving tithes and offerings, I will read. Here's what he said. This is a proclamation from the president, 16th president of the United States. And by the way, wouldn't you love to hear some presidents talk like this again? 
Whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and the just government of Almighty God in the affairs of men of our nation, has by resolution requested the President to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. And whereas it is the duty of the nation as well of men to their own, I love this, dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess, this isn't hard, our sins and transgressions and humble sorrow, yet with assured hope and with genuine repentance that will lead to mercy and pardon. We need to be pardoned. <laughs> and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures. I love hearing a man of God talk to the United States of America like this. He sounds like a preacher to me. Well, we didn't elect no preacher. You didn't have to elect him. God comes inside of a man that doesn't have anything to do with being elected. I'm serious. Most of you probably don't even know this. President Trump didn't get born again until three months before he was elected. That's when he accepted Christ with that group of evangelistic people that were around him. And that's why he started putting in, in his office when he got in men and women of God. And you hardly ever hear their names, but most of you know them on television and everywhere else, but that's who he's surrounded by. Paula White, his advisor. I mean, some of these deep kingdom people are in his life speaking into it. The news media's got he and I painted. I throw me in there because they describe me as racist. I pastor a non-denominational interracial church and I'm a racist. It's confusing, isn't it? Well, how do I know I'm a racist? Well, CNN said that if you're white and you're a male and you're a conservative and if you voted Republican, you're the problem, you're a racist and a bigot. And I thought, geez, I was just wrong color, I guess. I should have been a different color and voted all of that and I wouldn't be one. Isn't that strange? It's only the white people that are the racists and bigots in the Republican Party. Black folks are blessed. You're, you're in the Republican Party, and you're neither. Um, well, it's funny, but it's true. You see the world we live in, the condition of it, the information, information that is given us, people giving us information of what they want us to think. God's Word gives you information of what God thinks. And here's what he thinks. He thinks what he's wording right here. And he says, announced in the Holy Scriptures, proven by all history, that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And in so much as we know that his divine law, that nations like individuals are subject to punishment, chastisements in this world, and may we not justly fear that awful calamity of civil war. It's amazing to read this at a time like this. Y'all understand the threshold we're standing on today? And we're reading. See, the Bible says everything that has been will be again. And it says that everything that will be already has happened. So get ready for a repeat of history. But we can change history with prayer. Yes, you can. And so... He goes on to make it very clear. Which now desolates the land. Talking about civil war. And it may but a punishment of infliction upon our presumptuous sins. To the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. We have been the recipients. Oh my goodness. Of the choices boundless of heaven. Listen to what he says. And I wish y'all could see this beautiful picture of him sitting here, so humble. We have seen and we have been preserved these many years in peace and in prosperity. We have grown in numbers and wealth and power like no other nation has ever grown. They did in the 1860s as we're doing today. And he said, we have forgotten the gracious hand that has preserved us in peace 
and has multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our own hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. That's what's wrong with everybody. Everybody wants to be in self-control. When you're in self-control, unrighteousness rules. When you're in Holy Spirit control, the Holy Spirit rules. Righteousness rules. I don't care if you're in a, over a prayer team, a praise and worship team, uh, an evangelistic team. If you got to tell people, I'm in charge, you're supposed to do what I say. That is not leadership. That is being controlling. Leaders lead. They do not dominate people's lives. Oh, well, I better get back to reading. And so, by some superior wisdom of our own and virtue of our own, intoxicated with unbroken success, now we've become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. We're too proud to just pray to our God that made us. This is the president talking to the nation. He said, it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and for forgiveness. Hey, stop and think about it. The Republican Party was formed to maintain the freedoms of our Constitution, to stop slavery, and to bring it to a halt. And was also going to end up being a great, great opposition to the KKK. Do you realize that by listening to the media, you think the Republican Party is the party of the KKK? You think that they're the racists? And you think. They, they've, got a, they've got America trained like, like that. And it's the opposite. And you've got millions of people saying, No, he's crazy. That preacher's crazy. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not crazy. Satan's crazy. He's a liar. And I have no fear of him or man. None. I only fear God, and believe me, I do. Whew. Today, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I better, I better hush or I'll get off of it. Fifty years ago today was my first day in combat. Fifty years ago today. I'm sitting here reading this, and this is hitting me right now. And I'm going, wow, a half century it goes fast, church. It seems like it was yesterday. Just yesterday. That was 50 years ago. Today. One half century. Now, you're looking at me like, so, but for me, <laughs> it's like, what? I turn around and look back. What happened? That was fast. Wow, and I'm still here? Well, then there must be some more honey. I got a kick. Okay, let's go kick some honey. Because I am. The head and not the hiney. Deuteronomy 28. Now, therefore, in compliance with the request and fully concurring in the views of the Senate, the whole Senate, the Senate, oh, God, touch our Senate. I do by this proclamation designate and set apart Thursday, the 30th of April, 1863, as a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And I do hereby request all the people to abstain on that day from their ordinary <laughs> secular pursuits and to unite, I love this, as their several places of public worship and their respective homes. People used to have church in their homes, you know. Keeping the day holy to the Lord, whew, devoted to humble discharge of this religious duty which is proper to the solemn occasion. Will all this being done in sincerity and truth, he's closing, let us then rest humbly in the hope authorized by the divine teachings in the scriptures that the united cry of this nation would be heard on high and would be answered and would be blessed no less than the pardon of our national sins, the restoration of our now divided and suffering country 
to its former, he's confessing for it to go back to its former happy condition of unity and peace. Boy, I want that so bad. Do you know why we go in the military to kill people? For unity and peace? It's true. And if you don't ever want to kill anybody, just stay out of the military. And if you really want to kill somebody, go join. They'll use you. I'm not joking. I know. We always think about dying for our country. But my drill sergeant, he taught me when he asked me why I joined the military. I said, well, I'm willing to die for my country. I never said that again. He let me know I'm no good dead. He let me know it'd be nice and honorable that I died for my country, fighting for it. But he said, that's not what you're here to be trained to do. You are not going to be trained to die, boy. He said, you're going to be trained to kill. Do you understand? You're a killer. You're not dying. Said, yes, drill sergeant. <laughs> Hallelujah. I look too cute to say I'm a killer, don't I? A little sparkle on the teeth wouldn't hurt. Anyway. <laughs> That's all right. You shoot at me, I can shoot back. Hallelujah. Ask the North Koreans, they'll tell you. Anyway, he says this, and I'm just loving it. You have to forgive me. I'm happy right now. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and the cause of the seal, the cause of the seal of the United States to be affixed by the president, Abraham Lincoln. Now, I've got some scripture I would like to read to you. Can you pull that up in the Passion? I mean, the lights are pretty bright in my eyeballs this evening, if I had my hat. Most of all, I am willing to encourage you to pray with gratitude to God. Pray for all men with all forms of prayer and request. Thank you, ma'am. Don't y'all wish you had a hat like that? <clears throat> I know you do. Ah. <sighs> All forms of prayers and requests. <laughs> you went so fast, I missed the last part. You must have liked it more than I did. Hallelujah. And requests as you what? Intercede with the most passion and pray for every politically. Oh, Pastor, we're not supposed to be political. Well, then pray for them. That's <laughs> spiritual. So pray for every political leader. And representative, so that we would be able to be tranquil, undisturbed life. Don't you like tranquility? I love it. Don't you love running water? Man, I went out on my porch this morning and watched that sun turn those clouds purple and orange. I mean, I had a time. I love sunrises and sunsets. Let's move to the mountains. Oh, well. All right. I lost you, didn't I? So... Then he goes on to say, and pray for every political leader and representative so that we would be able to live tranquil and undisturbed lives. And as we worship the awe-inspiring God with a pure heart, it is pleasing to our Savior, God, to pray for them. Now, I'm going to show you an eight-minute, I think it's six, Black and white video, because it's 1969. And in 1969, when old brother Edward come out and started sharing with America what he, you're getting ready to hear, it's the exact same thing that I was taught when I went to Louisville, Texas to take headship Christian school education. In Louisville, the first class I had to go into was the Communist Manifesto and learn about how communism is infiltrating America, its plan, and its purpose. Well, that was in 1940 that I was reading the 1940 Communist Manifesto plan. And then, boom, all of a sudden, by 1969, there's a revelation in this country to our political leaders talking to America, trying to tell you something. I want you to listen to something from 1969 when I was 17 years old standing in front of an army recruitment station. What you're going to see came on television. And when that came on television, a few months later, I'm overseas. 
And I want you to watch this for just a moment. Have y'all got that ready? 1828, the communist... Can you pull it up on the screen? Let me declared that the racial differences among our people... They get it. They'll get it right. ...constituted the weakest and most vulnerable point in our social fabric. By constantly probing and can straining at this one so spot, they, see? they calculated that eventually the cloth could be torn apart and that Americans could be divided, weakened, Just and listen. perhaps even set against each other Close in open eyes. combat. We mustn't kid ourselves into thinking that the communists have placed their agitators only into the black communities. They're working both sides of the street. They want hatred, violence, and bloodshed between the races, and they don't care how they get it or whom they use, even children if necessary. Here is a book that I think ought to be in every home library. It's entitled Color, Communism, and Common Sense by Manning Johnson. He joined the party as a young man because he honestly believed that the communists were trying to improve the conditions of his people. He was a dedicated communist, and eventually he rose to one of the highest ranks. But after many years, he discovered that instead they were merely planning to use his people in a bloody revolution to destroy America. And when he woke up to this, he dropped out of the party and devoted the rest of his life trying to alert his fellow citizens of all races to the true nature of the Communist Party as he knew it to be from the inside. Manning Johnson said, Black rebellion was what Moscow wanted. Bloody racial conflict would split America. During the confusion, demoralization and panic would set in. Then finally the Reds say, Workers stop work. Many of them seize arms by attacking arsenals. Street fights become frequent. Under the leadership of the Communist Party, the workers organize revolutionary committees to be in command of the uprising. Armed workers seize the principal government offices, invade the residences of the president and his cabinet members, arrest them, declare the old regime abolished, establish their own power. Now, here is a piece of vicious communist propaganda that perhaps some of you have seen. It's called The Crusader. It's written by Robert F. Williams one of the organizers of the Revolutionary Action Movement. In this issue of the Crusader, the communists call not only for extensive chaos within the cities, but for putting to the torch every village, every forest, every field, and every barn. The plan is for raging fires from one city to the next. The reason? Well, first, there's the value of sheer destruction. Secondly, it would force us to deploy our defenses and rescue units over the widest possible area. Listen. The communists point out that as long as our police and National Guard remain concentrated, they're invincible. But if they can be forced to spread out over the entire city and into the countryside as well, then they can be picked off from ambush one by one. And the third value of massive fire to the communists is psychological. The average American, they say, soft and decadent. When he sees billows of black smoke rising from one horizon to the other, when at night the only light he has to see by is the flickering red from flames leaping into the sky, he'll become paralyzed with fear and panic. He'll run away and hide and do nothing to interfere with the guerrilla bands as they strike at the community's power centers. The Crusader explains how to set up sniper units in crowded metropolitan areas, how to manufacture jumbo Molotov cocktails, Listen. the gallon jug size and how to mix the gasoline with certain ingredients to make it burn like napalm. Mm -hmm. How to pour gasoline into utility manholes in the streets to set fire to the main telephone cables. How to put sulfur tips from matches into air conditioning units and blow up large buildings. How to ignite gas mains and oil storage tanks. It explains how radio-controlled model airplanes can be used to fly explosive charges over heavily guarded fences into gasoline storage areas or munition stockpiles. It even calls for infiltration into the National Guard units, revolutionaries posing as non-militants for the purpose of getting free military training and for gaining access to critical military supplies and heavy weapons. And then, finally, Robert Williams says this. Any all-out minority revolution must create a state of crisis wherein almost all of the male population would be forced to remain in their homes to protect their property and families. The middle class is very large, but it is not accustomed to deprivation and terror. Because of its affluence, it has waxed soft.
It has no stomach for massive fire, blood, and violence. The motive force behind its life drive is its endless pursuit of prestige, conspicuous consumption, and sensual pleasure. A few years of violent, sporadic, and highly destructive uprisings will set the stage for the grand finale. After the stage is properly set through protracted struggle, America could be brought to her knees in 90 days of highly organized, fierce fighting, sabotage, and massive firestorm. Ladies and gentlemen, the plans and preparations for a communist revolution of force and violence are far advanced. The organization behind these preparations has almost unlimited financial resources, and it provides both training and leadership based upon years of experience in many other countries. Our enemies are deadly serious about their task, and it's nothing short of national suicide for us to continue to ignore their plans and their progress. The violent revolution becomes of primary value to the communists to the extent to which it can be used to condition the masses psychologically to accept the non-violent revolution, which is offered supposedly as the only alternative. Hoping to avoid further violence and bloodshed, the public is to be pressured into accepting measures that will move the country gradually and legally toward communism, but without calling it that. The strategy of the proletarian revolution calls for the quiet conversion of our government into a communist regime, but under the banner yes. of socialism. Oh. Well, what is socialism? All right, let's define it. According to the dictionary, socialism is a political concept based upon the principle of government ownership and control of property, the means of production, and the avenues of commerce. Under socialism, those who run the government, and the communists are confident that in America they eventually will be the ones who do so, those who run the government will know who is to get something and who has to wait, and that represents control over human beings. What has all this to do with the communist revolution in America? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has everything to do with it because the building of socialism is the communist revolution in America. It represents the process whereby our country can be moved gradually toward communism without the people even being aware of it. No matter what grievance we may have, real or imagined, no matter what national problems we may face, the communists seize upon these as excuses to build socialism. They have one and only one solution for all problems. More government, more government, and then more and more until it's total government. And forgive me for saying it one more time, total government is communism. Hey, did you hear that? For years you've heard me speak of socialism. If you've been in this church, you've always heard me speak. And what did I tell you? It is communism's first cousin. And if you play with it, they're going to invite you into the house. And you're going to go from playing socialism, we all share, into communism. And now we all give the government everything we have. And now we are their puppets all you got to do is look at the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Just do a little study in history of what's going on with their people, their starvation. Look how the government experiments with the people in their bodies. Things that you, would even, you wouldn't even tolerate, accept, or even think this happening in the world, they're doing it. Cloning armies of soldiers, doing things that are just, just so far-fetched it's almost what would you call it man twilight zone but it's happening and it's happening but listen here's the key that's only information that's not the that's not the declaration that's not the way it is that's not the end of the story this is the revelation of what is coming to take from you. You still have the power. You still have the authority. You still have the time. You still have the chance. You still have everything you need to do exactly what we read from President Abraham Lincoln. As we repent and as we go to God and we repent for the sins of this nation. 
Even the Democrat Party that pushes so hard for abortion to kill babies, we have to go and get on our knees and say, oh God, I'm not walking on my feet. I'm walking on my knees today by faith. And I thank you today that you will forgive my country of this ungodly sin. We repent in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that you've received every one of those little babies into heaven. And I thank you, Father God, they have eternal life. But they were supposed to come and to release who you are into the earth. And that lying devil has come in to scuff their lives out. And I thank you that you're sending more and more and more into the earth that are bringing the wisdom and the purpose and the plan of God. The sons of God that are being born right now, coming out of the wombs of the women, growing up into the earth and releasing the power of God. Communism being being destroyed socialism being put out hey I decree and I speak to the Democrat party and to whom which I was born in raised in and all I knew I say to you repent of your sins get on your knees and ask God to forgive you of your ungodliness controlling people's lives and killing babies I rebuke you in the name of Jesus and now father I speak to the corruption in this nation and I thank you, you're not through getting rid of it. And I don't care who's in office as president, I decree corruption is to be wiped out of this nation. And I decree the people that need to pay for it shall pay. And I give you the praise, I give you the glory, and I give you the honor. Church, when I was 18 years old, I was going on patrol in the most booby trap place on the planet then and now. And I'm going to tell you something I feel sometimes at my age, in this day and this life, that's what I'm still doing. And I have to watch everywhere I go and where I put my foot. Because the enemy wants something set for you. And all he wants you to do is get distracted where you can't see the wires and you can't see the buttons. And when you trip them and step on them, ho. Oh, but you know what? Our feet are guided by a great light. Hey, we don't walk, we don't walk in blindness. We walk by faith. I don't need sight because faith sees it all, not a part. And I thank my God that he gave me his word. Ho! Oh! He gave me a word and he said it is like a hammer. What does a hammer do? It beats and it beats and it beats and what happens the rock starts cracking and cracking and cracking they call it making little ones out of the big ones <laughs> and God gave me this word you know what that hammer does it renews my mind I have to brainwash it with this hammer I have to brain beat it don't you ever brain beat a little bit and your mind shuffles a little bit you're like what but truth if you know it It'll set you free. But you got to know it. Look at somebody and say, you got to know it. You got to know it. The truth never set anybody free. You have to know the truth. And that truth you know is the truth that sets you free. Hello. Y'all know that story about the black woman during the slavery days. And what did her white slave owner do? Left her everything she had, the whole plantation. She loved her like a baby. Gave it to her in paperwork, signed and done. She took it home, put it on her mantle board, a mile down the road from the plantation, living in a shack. 20 years goes by. Insurance men talking to her. Oh, that's from my missy. Talked her into opening it and looking at it. <laughs> said, ma'am, do you realize what this is? She said, well, I'm just sure it's a letter that she loved me. She was so good to me, and she called me to her bed and gave me that and told me that this expresses how much she loved me. She didn't know that expression was you own the plantation. You'll never be a slave again, and you can free all the slaves that's here. It's all yours. Hey, that was the truth. She didn't know it. Whoa, that didn't get no shout. That's when y'all should have shouted. When you get truth, look what it does to you. Hey, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I got messed up. Are you hearing me? I know there's revival going because God's bringing me Baptist preachers. 
He done brought me one, and they wouldn't ordain him, and they wouldn't license him because before he got born again, he had been married and gotten divorced. Bunch of idiots. You are, if you're a preacher and you believe that, you're an idiot. Anyway, because it's not true. Nowhere in the Bible a divorced man can't preach. Nowhere. Oh, yes, it does say you got to be a man or one wife. He's talking about polygamy, dummy. Polygamy. Don't have more than one if you're going to go into ministry. You know how tough it is with one? Try to take care of two, three, four, five and go preach to the church. That's what he's talking about. Oh, well, anyway, I told him, let me have a meeting with your pastor and your leadership, and I will tell them how ignorant this is and show them truth. That's what I told him. He said, I'll tell them. He did. He said, let's go eat again. We go eat again. He said, you can't believe this. I said, what? He said, they reviewed that, and only two of them rejected it. They're going to license me. I said, well, praise God, man. That's really good. And so then another Baptist preacher in a large Baptist church around here, what does he do? He takes off and goes to Washington. Well, he's done had over 100 death, thre death threats. I mean, he's being accused of everything. I don't even know him. I just heard about it. Man, I called him up, and he didn't answer. It was an answering machine. I said, well, he's going to get it anyway. And I told him, I said, Pastor, I'm so proud of you. I heard what you did and where you're going. I heard what's happening to you. And I spoke the word of the Lord over him, and I told him no weapon formed against him will prosper. His righteousness was of God. And I said, if your church is hurting and you need some money or help, you call Shield of Faith. And I said, we will help you. Boy, my phone rang. Man, I want you to know I appreciate that word and I heard it. Boy, it inspired me. I've been going through such a hard time. Pe and he went on and on and I just ministered to him. He said, I've got to get with you. I said, what? He said, i got to get with you quick. And I said, well, that's fine. Let's do it. He said, all right, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I said, Monday. I said, that'll be quicker. So Monday at 1145, I'm having lunch with him. I've already warned him. I said, sir, you don't want to have lunch with me. I said, I will mess you up. I said, I will be talking about the Holy Ghost. And I'll be talking about the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God in a way that I don't know if you're used to hearing. I said, I will see you at 1145. So I know that Baptist preachers are starting to come to me and God's starting to move in their hearts because they're hungry for the Word, not a denomination. There's something going on, church. Now listen, I know you might see in a thing assignment of the presidential switchover, but don't be moved by it. There's some stuff going on you know not. I'm serious. Do not be discouraged. Our country is in the hands of our Father. And the sons and daughters of our God have been on their knees praying, interceding, fasting, and believing God. And I'm here to tell you right now, God never leaves his remnant behind. And that's all he needs. He had thousands go out to battle. And it got down to just 300. It's called Gideon's army. Everybody that drank water like a dog had to go home. But everybody that drank water like a man, they stayed. And it was only 300 of them. 300. And what did 300 do? Good Lord. Hey, we got to quit thinking we have to be a multitude. One with God is a majority. We are the head and not the tail. And America is still the freedom voice in a world of communism because it's predominantly communism out there. We are the rare. We are the few. The Marines think they are, but we do too. Hallelujah, because we are proud of God, and we are the few, and we are the mighty, we are the anointed, and we are the head. We're not the tail. We're above only. We never go under. Are you listening to me? You ought to stand up and give God a praise God. Hallelujah. Right in the middle of your country looking like it's going to hell. I say, hell, no. We are not going to let this country go to hell. This country is going to bring heaven to the earth. And the will of God will be done in the earth just like it is in the heavens. Can I get an amen from somebody? Are you ready to go out and witness, share Christ, lay your hands on people? 
And don't even worry about arguing with people about political stuff. Get on your knees and take it into the heavens because that's where nothing can stop you. And that's where everything you say is heard and everything that's in alignment with God, it will be done. Agree with God and he will always move. Don't agree with anything but God. And the Lord said that this nation, again, will be a nation that will be a light to the world. you got to understand we're a beacon. Oh, Pastor, you just don't know how much corruption's in this. Oh, Pastor. <laughs> well, look at you. You as a sinner. Look at all that corruption. Look at that mess you were. And now look at you. Why can't America do what you did? Why can't America repent and have a new life? Hey, you got to keep your hope. You got to keep your faith. The scriptures always say and stir one another up. Stir one another up while it's day. It's day. It's day. Hey, there's a night coming. You can't. Do it now. Do it now. Stir them up. Oh, I'm so happy right now. I can't behave myself. It's funny how during the week it's like, Lord, what do you want to say? What do you want to say? What do you want to say? And then when Sunday comes, there's not enough time to say it. Woo! And I love your shirt. It's red for the blood and it says blessed. You know what I love about blessed? It has less in it. And that's what blessed does. It takes less, puts a B on it and an ED on the end. And your less is now blessed. Hey, if you give less, you get blessed. Are you all right? All right. Well, praise God. Well, agree with me with this prayer, and I will dismiss you. I want to pray over our country. Are you all right? I have it in front of me because I don't want to miss it. Father God, we at The Shield and those listening, we pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that this sleeping giant, the church, who even now has began to shake herself, I do believe, from her sleep. Hey, and I pray that she's going to wake up into righteousness. She's going to wake up in a spirit of holiness. And I'm praying for this to happen in every denomination, every church, every body of believers. And I say to the slumber of the church, Slumber no more. Wake up. Wake up. The Listen to me. The bombs are coming. But if you're awake, we will fire them out of the air before they get here. Wake up, you mighty man. And I pray that we would begin unity. Unity under the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus Christ's cross. Somebody say amen. And we will preach the gospel of the kingdom of God very clearly and boldly in every highway and every byway in our nation until the gospel has been preached in every street of our whole nation in the world. And God, we pray that we will not only stand up and speak up, but that we will begin to reap up, hallelujah, a harvest in our nation. And we just decree now that we're bringing multitudes to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, and may revival of the saints be so encompassing that it affects the whole spirit spiritual complex of our entire nation and influences every political office, every politician, all of our economy and our media, everything that concerns our nation, our entire society. We release it into the kingdom of God and the purpose of God. And I say, blood of Jesus, cover it now. And now we thank you that in the midst of all the crookedness, that there's a straight path and in the darkness there's a light and father we choose the path and the light and we thank you for delivering our nation as we stand up and get bold in jesus name and everybody said hey hey glory to god i want something to hit that, won't, that i can't destroy everything i hit with this it bust my office is a mess it's a good thing it's just me in there at least the things I've already broke, I just keep breaking them instead of other stuff. I hit something the other day so hard, I cracked the hammer all the way down here. I didn't think that piece of oak, I was so mad at the enemy. <laughs> I 
I said, you lying devil. And my hammer about busted. I, I got to calm down. I get mean. I like to get mean. You would like me mean. Ah. Father, I thank you for this people. I thank you they're hungry. And they're hungry for your word and your spirit. I thank you filling them so full of the Holy Ghost that they can't do anything at night but pray in tongues. They think in tongues. I thank you, Father God, that the supernatural anointing will flow through them and through their hands when they lay them on the sick. There'll be signs, wonders, and miracles this week. I thank you for great testimonies next week concerning the things of God. And I give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for every good thing that you're doing in each individual's life and for our children. Ha <laughs> ha! We decree that a day like today is really for them. We are preparing ourselves for the next generation to come forth and to release the anointing and the power of God. That the next generation will not be restricted by government and by the silence of speech and the control of our lives. I thank you, Father, that our children will be free. Free to speak. Free to bear arms. Free to say what they want to say. Live where they want to live. Do what they want to do without the pressures and fear of man and government. And I thank you, Father, for a great nation that loves God. And everybody said, Woo! I love you. Go do the word. See you Sunday. Ugh.